like I said, I, I was not familiar with what autism was. Um, mental health is not something that was spoken uh, about in my family. You know, it's like, no, that doesn't exist. So um, I blamed myself initially. I, I thought my son was premature, so he was born at seven months. Um, so all of these factors started to come in, right? I was still in the military active duty. So it's like, was I doing too much? Was I not being careful enough? Um, even though, you know, my chain of command in the military was amazing and always took care of me. Um, but it was, okay, what did I do wrong? Was I not taking um, my prenatals? Was I not doing mm -hmm. enough for pregnant? Um, I lost a lot of weight during pregnancy. Um, so that, right? Um, also prior to my son, I had a miscarriage. So thinking, okay, am I, was I not healthy enough? We are starting a new series, Autism Beyond the Diagnosis. This topic is very near and dear to me because as you know, I have two boys with autism and I, I have a special guest with me today that's going to give you so much great information. Uh, even I, I'm going to learn this as well. So I'm excited about having her on the show. Today's guest is a mom of two who runs and lifts. She, oh, I want to talk about that as well. She also served in the U.S. Army and she's a children advocate and parent educator. Thank you for serving our country. And she is the co-founder and director of ABA Your Way. I want to talk about that. Brave Arts community, let's show some love to Joanna Horsfall. How are you doing this evening? Good, good. Thank you for having me. Good, good. Thank you for uh, for being a guest today with this new series because there's a lot of kids that have autism. And this is something that I think we have to continue to have these conversations about. So thanks again. I want to jump into this and I want to make sure that I respect your time. If you have any questions for today's guest, make sure that you leave a comment below. She will be able to help out as well. Uh, can you share your journey of discovering your child's autism diagnosis and how did that impact your family? Yeah, well, um, I think like a lot of parents, it was a very scary time. You know, there was a lot of mixed emotions, um, especially when noticing um, delayed speech. That was the first thing, kind of the red flag for us. Mm -hmm. um, our son was almost three and he didn't have a lot of language. Um, so that was hard. You know, the like I said, the diagnosis brought a lot of mixed emotions. I was scared, very, very scared. I come from a very traditional um Mexican family and first generation. So I didn't know what autism was, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm very blessed to have uh, my husband who kind of guided me through it. You know, he made me, he made me know that it was going to be okay. Everything was going to be fine. Um, there was a lot of guilt um, within me, right? I blamed myself because I didn't know what it was. I wasn't informed. There was things where I was like, okay, well, did I do something during my pregnancy? Could I have done something different? Mm -hmm. um, until I educated myself, like I said, my husband guided me a little bit through it because he was familiar with it. Mm -hmm. um, but over time, you know, it became a catalyst for growth. Um, it has made us so much better uh, as parents and as a family, as a growth, as a family um all together, excuse me, and because we began to focus on our son's strengths um, and his unique qualities um, and just the way he sees the world, because it's it's different to how, you know, my husband and I have experienced it. Yes. Um, definitely taught us a lot of patience um, and appreciation for all the small, the little victories, all those baby steps, right? Everything is a celebration for us. Everything that our son accomplishes, it's it's a big deal. So although the initial, you know, um, the initial impact was tough, um, it has definitely brought our, fam our family uh, closer together. Yes, for sure. Like you said, patience. You got to have patience because my two little ones, I mean, oh, I'm like, God is really helping me in that area. You know, when they talk about the patience of Job, I'm like, OK. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What are some of the biggest challenges you faced in the early years of parenting a child with autism? I think the biggest thing was really understanding the diagnosis. Mm. Uh, 
like I said, um, I didn't know what it was, right? There was a lot of uncertainty, a lot of confusion of what it meant and what it meant for our son. Um, understanding unique characteristics, right? Because autism is not a one size fits all. It's a spectrum. Every child on the spectrum looks different, behaves different. Um, so understanding what those characteristics were for. for my son um and then i think just the communication barriers that was like i mentioned earlier it was the the red flag right our son was speech delayed almost three um he had a difficult time communicating um he used to point and grunt and as a first time parent right he pointed i ran it's like oh that's what my baby wants right mm -hmm. um so understanding um how he communicated um, and, you know, just being able to guide him into using that, that functional communication because we did have um, behaviors um, when he started school, we call them maladaptive behaviors, right? Which is his aggression. He had aggression because he couldn't functionally communicate his wants and needs. So I think those were definitely the biggest challenges um, at the beginning for sure. Yeah, yeah, because my four-year-old, He has a lot of aggression and his speech is coming along slowly. Oh, yeah. Starting to, yeah, say, you know, he's starting to count. He can count. And uh he likes the 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 little uh songs, you know, all the different oh. songs and stuff. So he's starting to pick up on those things and knowing his ABCs and like you said, being patient. Uh I think that's the biggest thing because normally you just thinking like, Okay, maybe he he you know maybe he should be talking by now, mm -hmm. you know, our timeline, not not yeah. God's timeline, right? Right. Those expectations um, that sometimes we set for our children um, mm -hmm. without, like I said, without really understanding, you know, especially with the diagnosis, if every child is different. Like you said, your son is is counting now, right? Um, And some kiddos take on to the music, right? That's what gets them started. Um, every kid has something different. So yeah, it's it's removing our expectations um, and being patient with them. Yes, yes. Earlier, you talked about having like mom guilt. How, how did you how did you process that? And then. Like, how did you overcome that? Like, um, yeah. how did you get over it? Because I believe a lot of moms deal with that. Like, was it something I did wrong? You know, how did you, how did you do that? That's a great question. Um, like I said, I, I was not familiar with what autism was. Um, mental health is not something that was spoken uh, about in my family. You know, it's like, no, that doesn't exist. So um, I blamed myself initially. I I thought my son was premature. So he was born at seven months. Um, so all of these factors started to come in, right? I was still in the military active duty. So it's like, was I doing too much? Was I not being careful enough? Um, even though, you know, my chain of command in the military was amazing and always took care of me. Mm -hmm. Um But it was, okay, what did I do wrong? Was I not taking um, my prenatals? Was I not doing mm -hmm. enough for pregnant? Um, I lost a lot of weight during pregnancy. Um, so that, right? Um, also prior to my son, I had a miscarriage. So thinking, okay, am I, was I not healthy enough mm -hmm. uh, for my son, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I beat myself up about it a lot. Um, and then, like I mentioned earlier, I had my husband who was very supportive, you know, and kind of um, reassured me that it wasn't my fault, right? It was not something that I could have prevented during my pregnancy. Um, and honestly, just diving into ABA, um, understanding the diagnosis, that's kind of what helped me overcome that. Um, I became almost obsessive with it, right? Of understanding what it was, what can I do? How can I help my child? How can I advocate for him? Um, and I'm not gonna lie to you and I'm not gonna lie to parents. You know, there's times where I still feel bad. We just had a situation um, a couple of weeks ago when school started where I came to my husband in tears, right? I'm like, I've tried everything, what more? He's like, you've tried everything. It's not your fault, you know? it. Some things are not going to work 
based on the plan, right? Again, those right. expectations. Mm -hmm. um, so I think just diving into what the diagnosis was, having the support um, of my husband was was incredibly helpful to mm -hmm. to help me with that guilt. Yeah. For sure. Shout out to your husband for, for <laughs> you know, being patient. So was he familiar with, did he have any kind of background in, in you know, like maybe like ABA therapy or did he ever have that kind of exposure before you were married? Because it seems like he was pretty grounded with, with the situation, you know. Yeah. So um, my we met in the military, so he was in the army um, when I was, um, but he was a little bit more familiar with like ADHD, um, just mental health um, in general because of his family. Um, and, you know, um, his uh, aunt, who's also his godmother, um, worked for our in Inland Regional Center out in the Inland Empire. So he was familiar with it, just being around them also um, and just having her um, as, you know, someone to touch bases with on what, what those things were, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So ha have your perspective on autism and parenting evolved over time? Like, where were you at once you found out uh, the diagnosis and where you are today? Like, what was that evolution like for you? Yeah, I think at the beginning, um, it was, like I said, just seeing the challenges, right? It was primarily looking through a lens of challenges. What is my child going to experience? Um, how is he going to be treated? Right. I think that's a big thing. Um, but I think I've realized that with parenting a, a child um, on the spectrum, it's not about trying to change them. And this is something that I always share with my parents that I do parent education with. It's not about trying to change them to fit those society norms. Um, it's celebrating their individuality, um, advocating for their needs, their rights, um, you know, fostering a, an environment that values their, their needs, especially their communication styles, their interests, their expressions. Um, I know we keep saying this, right? But understanding the importance of patience, that is so, so, so important. So um, my, I think that's how my parenting style has yeah. evolved because yeah. I do also have another son, right? Who's um, neurotypical. He doesn't have a diagnosis. So parenting them is very different. Um, but patience um, has, I think, definitely been the biggest one, Um I think for both of us, you know, both my husband and I, because again, we come from the military, right? Where everything's like, go, 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 go. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. You're doing what you're being told, being where you're supposed to. There's nothing else, right? So that's what we were used to. And then here comes our son, where it's like, okay, everything has to slow down. You have to be patient. I'm not moving as fast as you guys are. So definitely, like I said, just understanding that I, we are not going to make them make, make him excuse me fit in it's more of a accepting and celebrating him yeah. how he is how he how he was sent to us right I know you mentioned God earlier which um we are big on uh yes. so I, I always tell my husband God sent me Jeremiah the way he sent to me for a reason mm -hmm. and I, I truly believe that so yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. My yeah, my oldest son name is is Jeremiah. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> awesome, <laughs> great choice. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> For sure. <laughs> yeah, and, and and I like that you say about celebrating, you know, just who they are because, you know, culturally, like you said, we see life one way, but mm -hmm. the way they see it is is different. And to make that transition, to think outside of yourself. It does. It, it takes a lot of patience and and grace, you know. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes. What self care strategies have been most effective for you as a parent of a child with ASD? Um, for me, really, it's just regular physical activity. I that is my self care. Um, I go out there. I stay active as much as I can. Um, I go to the gym. Um, I run. I run half marathons, working on that full marathon, hopefully by next year. Um, but that's that's what um, helped me uh, 
take care of me, just being active. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you, how do you prepare? Cause I guess I'm not the greatest at running and, and trying to make sure <laughs> that yeah. I keep my stamina up. I'm working on it, but is that something that you just fell in love with or yeah. you kind of trained yourself into like running? Yeah. So I, I really started running when I was in the military, right? That's big um, for us in our physical training mm -hmm. Um, running. It was not my favorite back then because mm -hmm. I had to do it. Right. Uh, but I would do it outside of work. Um, I started, I think back in 20, 2011, um, mm -hmm. a little bit after our son was born. Um, and it's, I would start running, stop, start running. Um, and then I picked it up again um, more consistently. And it's just, I follow up. I have to have a plan. I'm that type of person that has a plan <laughs> for, <laughs> for myself. So I just, um, I do a running plan and um, work myself up to, to those events. And I, and that's my goal. It's always having, you know, I have a race this date. I'm preparing for this. And that's how I get myself there. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. So how do you and your spouse find time to connect with having children? Because I know a lot of people ask this question, especially the married couples. How do you find time to connect? Yeah, um, well, both my husband and I have very demanding jobs, right? We're very busy. Um, so we try to fit in time wherever we can. Um, even if it's just 15, 30 minutes throughout our days, um, sometimes we both work from home so we're able to talk throughout the day right or at the end of the day just um talking about our day I'm just being able to talk to each other about that um, mm -hmm. working together um when it comes to our child's care right um we divide and conquer yeah. one of us takes one one of the other takes the other um because that makes sure that we're both taken care of and not one person is completely worn out by by the day and everything that the kids having have going on um and then just we've really learned to be flexible with um our expectations right because we can plan and say okay every month we're gonna have um a date right mm -hmm. date night mm -hmm. life happens right sometimes he's caught up with work i'm caught up with work something came up with the kids so just making sure that you have those even if it's just 15 to 30 minutes of just how is your day, right? It can be work-related, not work-related, but just um, making that time for each other. Mm -hmm. Like I said, as short as it as sometimes is, you know, 15 minutes, like, how's your day? This happened, this happened. Okay, let's continue our day, right? Mm -hmm. um, and for us, really, it's it's humor, right? We try to um, laugh at things and because I think our work is always so serious. And so it's just, I think humor has been been a big one um with us for sure yeah yeah I hear you because the demand um with two and, and you know we have three <laughs> so uh date nights I, and I try so hard for us to <laughs> try to so hard and yeah. it's just like life as they say life be life and it's just one of those things yeah. uh like my son had a doctor's appointment today. I had to go to the doctor today because my foot was bothering me. And I'm just like, left work early, all these different things, come home, the kids, you know, they're young, got to get them baths and, and you know, all these different things. And on top of work. Right. Yeah, it, it is. Yes, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what are some common misconceptions about autism? that you often encounter in your advocacy efforts? Oh, man, I could talk about this one forever, right? <laughs> but just some listening. basic ones, you know, is that it's a disease um, that needs to be cured. It's mm -hmm. not, it's not like the flu. It's not, it's not COVID. Um, it, you know, it's a neuro neurodevelopmental difference. It's not an illness, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's part of their identity. So I think that's a big one. Another one would be that all people with autism are the same. We mentioned this earlier today, right? Yeah. It's autism is a spectrum. Every child is different. I can have my already 13 year old, he, thir he turned 13 on Friday, have a brand new teenager. Um, but I could, you know, I could have another 13 year old that's, you know, 
black and Mexican and, you know, that's also on the spectrum, but will be completely different from my son, right? Um, they can both have my son's deficit is social skills, his social interactions. Mm -hmm. I can have another child with the same, but they are still very different. Every child on the spectrum is different. There's not, that's why we say there's not a one size fits all, right? Every treatment plan, the way their services, everything has to be tailored for them because they're all different. Mm -hmm. um, Another one um, that autism is caused by by vaccines, right? Um, it's been debunked by scientific research, um, but the myth is still there. I I still um, get parents that you know that that's what that's what they believe that uh, that it would that their son got or daughter got autism when they got their vaccines as babies. Yeah, yeah, I hear that one a lot. Yes, yes. And you see the ads, right? And they'll pop up um, on your social media. Um, like all my social media is about, you know, autism advocacy. So I get them, you know, um, but then another one that autism is always visible. This one, very passionate about because I always get, well, your son doesn't look like he has autism. Well, what does it look like? Yeah. Um, and I think that's a big one. Um it can be visible for some kids, right? Or young adults, adults. Um, but just because someone doesn't look like it doesn't mean that they're not on the spectrum. Like we said, it's it's a spectrum. It's different. It looks very different for every single person that has the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Yes, for sure. So what is what is your uh what is one thing that your son is really, really good at? Cause like for for mine, the my five-year-old. He loves the like he loves talking about states and countries. He loves geography. He can tell you about <laughs> he can tell you about any state or city, you know, at five years old. It's it's crazy. But yeah. what is one thing that your son loves that uh, stands out about him? So my son loves ancient history. Mm. Um, anything um ancient history he can talk about forever um and then right now he just started seventh grade so he's learning about world history so as soon as he gets in the car it's mom today I learned this right um I let him know we had a few months ago we had a conversation where I was like oh you know where my family comes from I looked it up and it says that that Aztecs were there right because the Aztecs and Mayans um mm -hmm. I was like it's he did research. He told me what every Aztec god was, their names, which are very complicated names. I don't even try to say them, right? And Spanish is my first language. But he told me the names of the gods, what they were gods of. He can name them all. And it's like anything, history, yeah. he's all for it. He can talk about it yeah. all day. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So how can other parents become more involved in advocacy for their children? Yeah, um, there's a few things, right? Just, um, I think a very important one is educating yourself about your child's needs. Um, like we mentioned through, throughout today, throughout this conversation, every kid is different. Yeah. So what my, you know, what my work for my son might not work for yours or, you know, the next person. So just educating, excuse me, yourself mm -hmm. on his or her specific needs um, because they have different strengths, different challenges. Um, I think the more you know, the better you're able to advocate for your son or daughter. Mm -hmm. um, but another one, learning your, your legal rights. Um, and that kind of goes hand in hand with my next one, which is advocating at school meetings. Know your rights. And um, there are so many resources out there um, for you know kiddos to have an IEP a 504 plan um, mm -hmm. knowing your rights knowing that you know what you can and cannot do knowing that you don't have to sign that IEP right there and then when you're in that IEP meeting right mm -hmm. asking questions um, you can call an IEP meeting at any time he's your child right um and then, you know, building collaborative uh, relationships with any other services that you might be receiving, anybody that's involved in your child's life. So if you get ABA services, speech, mm -hmm. OT, 
physical therapy, just building those relationships with them um, and the school, the school. And it's also very important, you know, building those relationships um, so that everyone's on the same page. Everybody is implementing the same things that you're implementing. So then it's generalized and that helps you advocate for your child, helps your child even more. Um, for example, I'm very involved. Um, my family laughs because when IEP meet, his IEP meeting comes up, they're like, oh, you got this one. You know, they, they already know. <laughs> because I ask all the questions where I'm like, okay, why are we doing this? What is this gonna do for my son? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and okay, well, you're saying this is what you're seeing at school. Well, this is what I'm seeing at home. These are the skills that I implement at home when he becomes frustrated, right? We're doing taking breaks. He's asking for breaks. He's able to sit out. He, you know, all the, the skills or strategies that I use in the home with my son, mm -hmm. I share them with the school, um, which has been very beneficial. Um, you know, me sharing what works for us, then mm -hmm. they implement them at school. And they're like, oh, this worked. Or you know what, Mrs. Horsfall, it didn't work at school this time. So just that collaboration with everyone involved in your in your children's um, life. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's good. That's good. So can you tell us about ABA Your Way and how that came about? Um, yeah. So ABA Your Way is an ABA services um, company. Um, we are in our second year of business. Um, our founder um, was my mentor. Um, that's who mentored me when I started in the ABA field back in 2019. Um, we kind of went our separate ways, still in touch, but we worked for different agencies. Um, and we kind of came back together to to start a new company, right? To help more kids. We're both very, very passionate about what we do. Um, she's been in the field for over 20 years. Um, I started in 2019. Uh, we provide in-home services mm -hmm. for not only children with autism, but many different diagnoses such as ADHD, ODD, ADD, um, kids that might just have a learning disability. So, um, we come to the homes, we provide the services. Of course, we do an assessment before we do anything. Um, and, you know, we our focus is just that compassionate care. Um, ABA has bad reputation. I think a lot of people here, you know, ABA is bad, ABA tortures. And you know what? Maybe at one point it did. ABA has come a long, long way from when it started. Just even from when I started in 2019 to now. It has grown so much. Um, when I started, I still saw a lot of those forced eye contact goals, right? Um, which I myself look away when I'm having a conversation, right? Um, mm -hmm. Our code of ethics has um, been updated. The last update was in 2020, which is ABA is just transitioning into more compassionate care, um, making sure, you know, that kids have a say so in that they're not just you're doing this because I told you to. We're teaching them skills, teaching them and teaching the parents. Um, at ABA, your way, we're big on parent training, parent education, right? Because as much as we love our kids, I get so attached to all of our clients. Um, we don't want to be there forever. We do, but we don't, right? Because we want to teach the parents how to also implement those skills so that they're able to do it with their children also. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I yeah. could talk about this forever. Sorry. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly why I wanted you to be a guest on the show. I mean, you, you were kicking this series off. So exactly. Oh, thank you. On the show. <laughs> right. Uh, I want to, well, real quick question. We talked about eye contact. Do you think eye contact, I don't know it's kind of like off the record, but do you think eye contact have changed with the emergence of the phone and the, and the scrolling? Do you think that has anything to do? Because people really don't look people in the yeah. eye. And it's almost, people almost look at it as like creepy if you look at somebody. I don't know. Yeah, I, you know, I haven't looked much into it. Um, and I'd never actually consider it being because of the phones. Um, you know, but now you mentioned it, yeah, everybody's kind of glued to their phones. Um, but I think with the forced eye contact, it's I think 
that's what kind of feels creepy, right? Just uh, engaging in a regular conversation. You make eye contact. I I talk with my hands a lot. Yes, mm -hmm. I've been doing this entire time. <laughs> um, and I I don't know. I get awkward like when I feel like somebody's staring right into my soul. <laughs> so I like I look away or you know I move around. Um, but I think forcing someone to just stare at you is it's kind of that's the I feel like that's the creepy part right so um whatever it makes you comfortable I think I think that's where that comes into place with ABA that it's like okay maybe a child is not comfortable with that eye contact we're not going to force it right I know my son there's days where he will provide a lot of eye contact and mm -hmm. there's days where he might not be engaged on his phone because he has every electronic right mm -hmm. um but he still answer my questions, but he's looking at somewhere else off to the side or he's looking down. It's just kind of on the day, the type of day that he's having too. So. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. That was just random question. You know, <laughs> eye contact. I, I, I do a lot of interviews, so I'm big on eye contact, but I'm realizing as time goes on that, you know, yeah. people, you know, you can look off every every couple of seconds you know right yeah for sure uh, yeah yeah I always thought I grew up in that era you know eye contact is so important that whole thing but mm -hmm. anyway absolutely <laughs> <laughs> yeah for sure uh Joanna I want to acknowledge you first of all for serving our country um I want to acknowledge you for being an advocate for uh the autism uh, spectrum disorder because it's it's needed we need to have more of these conversations and uh i want to acknowledge your marriage and for you and your husband to make this work because us as parents of kids with asd like we know the challenges it's one thing to talk about it but it's another thing to live it so i want to uh, acknowledge you for those things let everyone know how they can get in contact with you um, yeah, so I have my social media, um, which is um, J-O-H dot A-N-U-H. Um, and uh, you can just look me up, Joanna Horsefall. My name will pop up. I think I'm the only one. I hope so. Um, and yeah, that's that's the way anybody um, can contact me um, for anything. Um, like I shared, I'm, I'm huge on helping out parents. Um, it's one of my primary uh, passions because I was once that parent that didn't know what to do, right? So I'm, I'm always happy to help. Yes, for sure. Thank you so much for your time. Brave Arts community, you heard it here. So I'll have everything linked up in the description below, just in case you want to get in touch with Joanna. So <clears throat> everything will be down below in the description. Also leave a comment. What were your thoughts on this episode? And were there any questions that we possibly missed that you would like to know? Um, and then I can possibly even just send those questions to you. Uh, so if you are watching this via YouTube, make sure you hit the subscribe button, share this with someone because you never know. There's parents that might be struggling and they might not talk about it publicly, but this video can help them. If you are listening to this via podcast, leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. By doing so, it puts you in a drawing for a free Amazon gift card. Who doesn't like free stuff? This is Sean Heineman with special guest Joanna Horsfall, and we are out. <laughs>